we're now at a point where we have about 95% of the school have profound and multiple learning difficulties and only about 5% have severe learning difficulties. So we're working with some of the um, most profoundly handicapped children in the country. When you're working with kids like ours, especially the more complex kids, I think you need, you need to think outside of the box in terms of what does independence mean. So the independence is much broader really in terms of not just what they do for themselves, but how they relate to everything that you do with them. Time for our dinner, time for our dinner. Cooks in the kitchen, it's time for our dinner. Time for our dinner, time for our dinner. Everyone's hungry today. Each child at Stephen Hawking Special School has an independence target. Eating and drinking independently is a common target, and this in-school clinic helps achieve it. Hold it, Habil. Hold it. Bella, good boy. Take it back to your plate. Bella, good boy. Drink. Water. Rahana. Doing him a little drop of water. Just hold it. Hold it. Here you go. Big beans now, then. Can't just bone. That's it. Well done. It's potato. Hold it. Take it back to your plate. Good boy. Habil, some sweet corn, vegetables. Hold it. Bella, good boy. For us, the independence goals and independence targets for the pupils is a key part of their education. If we don't develop those things with those children whilst they're here, then their life chances will be significantly reduced. Across the board, actually, for all children, I would say that without those independence targets there, the children would not achieve what they are achieving now. I mean, I wouldn't say that we've, you know, we've got it right for every single child. It, it's not always that, <clears throat> that easy. Um, but I think where, where it has been key particularly are for children with severe learning difficulties who've come to us at the age of two or three and because of the work that we have put in with regards to independence targets, the work that we put in regarding sort of multi-professional support means that a lot of those children, well, all of those children have gone to mainstream. The eating and drinking team brings together a number of professionals. We have a very skilled speech therapist in school who has um, lots of experience in, in managing children's oral problems. She has far more skill than I do, and I think she has a, a bigger picture of how everything oral fits together. Mm. Mum's finding it very difficult to get her to yeah. eat anything at home. Yeah. I think you're right, broaden her skills in terms mm. of um, making sure that she's eating with more people, because mm. that could include doing some work with Mum at home. And that ties in with that Mum's already requested to come into school and have a look and see how we do it. Okay. So we've made an appointment for Mum to come in next Thursday. And yeah. the dietitian and I have made an appointment to a joint home visit as well. Oh, so maybe yeah. if we were involved mm. when Mum comes into school as well, that'd be great. Then we could yeah. feedback when we do our home yeah. visit too. Yeah, mm. that'd be really good. Another member of the eating and drinking team is uh, um, the occupational therapist who advises on things that we can do to encourage physical development of skills. So in terms of holding, you know, use cutlery utensils, positioning. She has a very wide range of skills that we as teachers don't have. I think this is maybe too big. He yeah. might need a teaspoon yeah. size, but with uh, this... One of the difficulties with using foam is that he likes to chew it, he likes to bite oh, bits off, it? and that's, so we have to that's how our, you know, our previous spoon was damaged okay. because he bit it quite a lot. Okay, <laughs> we'll try something else. Does he chew the metal on the, on the no. spoon? No. So we probably need something with a big handle, mm. but maybe plastic, and mm. then the um, spoon bit is, mm. is going to be metal. Metal, yeah. I'll have a look and yeah. see whether we have anything. That'd be lovely. And get one. And so it's the coming together of the person who knows the child very well and people with other expertise, that's invaluable. I don't think the children can progress to the same degree without that amount of multi-professional input. Probably 80% of the school's population has some problem with, with eating and drinking. Um, to release the staff to go to all of those clinic appointments if they weren't on site, I just couldn't do. We wouldn't be able to run the school. So with them being on site, it means that we can get through a larger number of children throughout a day, we can meet a larger number of children's needs. The school involves parents where it can. I've had a discussion with um, 
Isabeth and with Kirsty now, multi-professional team, um, about Kishan's eating and drinking skills. Because what he tends to do at school is he, he scoops with his spoon very, very quickly, gets lots into his mouth and then can't manage, so has to take it out and it's... Uh, so we've, one of our concerns. Yeah, so we've talked about ways to slow him down. Parents on the whole want to help their children develop. And so it's really important that the school and the family work together on the same targets. Um, he does mm. usually love his food, mm. doesn't he? It's quite often at school he has two dinners. Really? He'll have, he'll have his first one and, then, uh, and um, then Sarah would ask him, would you like more? And so he'll go up to the hatch and get a second dinner. Yeah. And then he'll have some dessert of some sort as well. I notice mm. he does overeat sometimes. But... I don't know. What I don't know. I think if he to... wants to eat, he wants to. I mean, he's not overweight or he's not... No, he's not no, overweight. No. If you take, example, Nasmin with a gastrostomy feed, she really shouldn't be using that. She should be eating orally because it's not there for a medical reason. But, but because at the moment she's only eating orally at school, she's not doing it at home, that's going to be a much longer process for her than if we could encourage it to be used at home. So it is really important that we're both working towards the same target. Oh, well done, Nesmin. Well done. Independence targets are used not just for eating and drinking. They apply to almost everything the children do in school. To get all staff involved um, with independence targets has, has not always been easy. It's about working with staff and providing training, providing them with the opportunity to see the effect that those independence targets will have, so that you move away from that culture of, oh well, never mind, look, poor thing, let's do it for them. Can you take the register, Kishan? There you go, hold it by the handle. I mean, for, for a pupil like Kishan, the independence targets are key because otherwise he would be dependent upon adults. Kishan, very good job. You're going to go back to the classroom now. One of Kishan's targets is to walk independently around the school, but part of that also is to come into school from the bus in the morning. He needs some assistance to actually get off the bus, but once he's off the bus, he can physically walk it in through the building and find his way to the classroom. And for him, that's quite a big step in two respects. One is that he's very recently just learnt to physically walk independently. And secondly, it's about keeping his attention or his focus on where he's going. It's about making it into the classroom without getting distracted and being enticed into another direction, which for him is a big step personally to be able to focus on. A child like Kishan, when he came here, was not able to move independently. He has, over the years he's been in school, learned to crawl, then learned to walk. And his, his learning has moved on significantly since he has been able to get up, move around, explore things himself. It means that the teacher, the support staff in the class don't have to take everything to him. They don't direct his learning entirely. He can actually be self-directed as, as well. And without his ability to move independently, we would control everything. Now, for not all, all children are going to be able to do that, obviously, because for, for some children who have severe physical disabilities, they aren't going to be getting up and moving around. And that's when we need to provide them with choice so that they can be self-directed as much as possible. However, Kishan can do that independently now. And I would say that that's a huge success. Independence targets are monitored at weekly meetings. Can we just talk about um, Kishan going around the school? <laughs> because um, one of his targets is to um, follow directions independently. Um, to different places around the school and you've been going to the library as part of your English lesson for half a term now. Um, how much of that is he able to do on his own now? Do he find his own way there yeah, yeah, without any problem? Idea. Do you think there's any way we could um, move him on a little bit in terms of finding his way around the school or we could, keep, we could put the fruit somewhere else? Yeah. yeah. Especially if he's a bit flappy in the morning and I think mm. it's a good, good thing to say, well come in there Kishan, it's your, yeah. your turn yeah. to go and get, yeah. time to go and get the fruit or go and get the milk. Well, planning and evaluation is vital to everything that we do, um, partly because um, many of the children are doing individual work that I'm not directly um, taking part in. So I need feedback from the staff on how the sessions have gone with them. But also, I can only see so much in a lesson. I need feedback from the staff. They need to know how they're participating in it. 
you know, and, and also we work together as a team. We need to be uh, discussing and planning ahead together. OK, because now it's time for our story. Encouraging independence means that children with special needs can be taught much like any other child. We work very hard in schools like this up and down the country, you know, to, to give our kids access to the same sorts of things that children that are in mainstream schools would have without, you know, the problems that our kids have got. And so you have to think, how can I give these kids that sort of creative opportunity? You'd naturally do storytelling with kids that didn't have learning difficulties. That's all you're doing. What I wanted us to think about is the way we've been doing our story for the last couple of weeks. Um, what effect it's had on the children and how we can encourage each one of them to do a little bit more. Kishan, he's more able to focus on the lesson. He's more able to um, participate in lots of different ways, like he, he, he makes the gestures, he does the signing. Do you think there's more that we could do to encourage him to, to join in? Because what he's doing, he's, do he's actually predicting yeah. what's coming yeah. next, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Do you think that the fact that he's predicting is as much as he's going to be able to do? Not unless you get him to sit with a child who he could help. You know, like, mm. as in, mm. to participate mm. in. Mm. Someone like Michael, Michael, I was thinking. Yeah. You know, like, we would do the movement mm. on that. <coughs> That's if we get Kishan mm. to do it for yeah. Michael yeah. on Michael's try. Yes. And that might really encourage Kishan to do mm. a bit more as well, because and he's showing... Someone else has to do it. A oh, that's like. a really good idea. Yeah. Yes. Go! And Rabbit was running really, really fast! <laughs> One of the difficulties I've had in the past is children who aren't able to respond to one person leading the group. They're very much dependent on the person sitting next to them to provide their, their structure in an activity. And, and I felt that that interactive storytelling is one way of addressing that need. It provides children with a focus in a group activity, which they can't always achieve in another other way. And I'd be hoping that what it encourages this independent interaction within a group situation, which is something that children wakes up. in this school find quite difficult. Well done, Habil. Thank you for joining in. Well done. It's funny, when, when we first spoke about trying it out in Janet's class and I spoke to the whole class and they said, well, what do we do then if we haven't got switches and props and symbols? I said, you don't, you don't do any of those things. You just tell the story. You tell the story and the kids enjoy having the story and they listen to the rhythm and they'll participate in their own individual ways, which I, I think is what is beginning to develop in that classroom. Different kids are really showing how they are engaging and joining in in their own individual ways. And that individuality which it allows is really important to independence, I think. Rabbit jumps up and he starts running as fast as he can, said Nazmin. Oh, he's getting out of breath. Oh no, it's too late because Tortoise is the winner! Yeah! Slow and steady wins the race.